I'll go ahead and introduce the the first speaker. It's Robert Smith um, with Wildlife Mississippi, and he's going to talk to us about uh, the history and utility of coastal herbivory. So yeah, Robert, I see you're starting to share your screen, so appreciate that. And I'm going to mute myself and take it away. Good morning. Thanks, Eric. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for logging on. I'm going to give a 10,000, well, I'm really a 60,000 foot overview about coastal herbivory, uh, some of the history, and then uh, how we can use it. Um, we've got a lot of different kinds of coastal grasses, the fire maintained piney woods, whether that's longleaf wiregrass, longleaf blue stem, slash pine savanna. Uh, we've got coastal marshes, high marsh, uh, low marsh. Uh, Spartina patens was grazed fair, fairly heavily. Um, and we've got our coastal chenilles over in Texas and Louisiana for the main part. And that what we're going to talk about today applies to all those habitats and, and more. Um, when we think about native rangeland, everybody, you know, tall grass prairie is an obvious rangeland. It's the dominant grasses out there, little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. Uh, if you look at longleaf blue stem grass, the dominant grasses there are little blue stem and a bunch of other blue stems, some panic grasses, Indian grass, and switchgrass. And it's a lot... Um, the longleaf blue stem doesn't get as much uh, sunlight on the ground, but we've got a longer growing season and we've got better water in many cases in the tall grass prairie. And so it's it's interesting that we don't think about that as being being a rangeland or a grazing land. Um, historically, we had bison across the, the southeast, fewer in the deep south and then other parts of, of the south and fewer east of the Mississippi River. Uh, uh, Panfilo de Noves in 1528 saw the great shaggy black cattle uh, grazing in the uh, West Spanish Florida. We call that uh, Louisiana today. Um, we, we had bison documented all the way down into Central Florida. Uh, 204 years later, uh, Pierre Sir de Iberville sent uh, Allegis du Roule up the uh, Pearl River in a longboat uh, in 1732, and they talked about killing bison on the sandbars in the Pearl River as far north as around Columbia, Mississippi. And so we've got historic documentation that there were herds of bison moving around the deep south uh, as recently as, as a few hundred years ago. And at that same point in time, and one, one of the things interesting, Cabeza, um, uh, Emilio de Norvez said that the great shaggy black cattle tasted better than the Spanish cattle they brought with them. Uh, so that's just an interesting side note. Uh, but at the same point in time, when they brought the cattle and, and sheep and hogs and goats in, uh, we really started to rain there of free range grazing in the deep south and in these coastal wetlands. And that continued up through the 1960s. And some of the, the range wars as we shut down free range grazing were interesting. Um, uh, the, the tick fever with the cattle had a, had a lot to do with it. And the first cattle grazing districts were set up around where we had heavy ag, where then people were trying to fence cattle out. Or then we started having people shift over to a modern breed of cattle that put on a little more weight, and they didn't want them breeding with the scrub cattle down the road. And uh, they did better on improved, what we call improved pasture. And so we started shifting away from uh, grazing in the woods. In the there was there's a lot of old research, if you will, from the early 1900s on up through the 1960s, put out by the Forest Service, the Soil Conservation Service. Uh, and other parts of the U U.S. Department of Agriculture talking about the grazing in the woods and the, how to do it and how it was done and, and stocking rates and cattle forage quality and those kinds of things um, because it was a normal part of life. And we're two, three generations later, and we've forgotten that in many cases, that, that it's really only been the last two generations of people that we haven't had something out in the woods eating on those grasses. Um and if we, we look at those habitat types that we talked about, there's really three major disturbance um, agents that, that impact those, and, and the storms is one of them. We can't do a lot about that. The other is fire. Uh, we did a really good job of getting fire out of the woods in the early 1900s, and that really hurt some of our, our grazing efforts in the woods. And when we people talk about herdsmen in the woods, they talk about, well, they burned in the spring. And the spring fires after the, the heavy winter was one of the most important fires. But if you go look at the, the primary documents in those cases, the old, the old letters, the old diaries and things, they were really burning all the time. And they weren't, the herdsmen weren't stupid. They knew that uh, fire improved cattle grazing and improved weight gain. And so they really burned throughout the year, uh, in addition to, to wildfire, native fire. And then we had herbivory. 
Uh, and that was from the, the bison. And we replaced that with cattle, sheep, goats, hogs. Uh, we also had, you know, there's a difference between a, a grazer and a browser and a selective browser going and taking individual pieces. And we also got smaller browsers, smaller herbivory animals out there, whether it's a, a gopher tortoise or, or insects. But uh, we, we've lost our major mega fauna that were, were grazing in the understory and some of the impacts that had. And it just wasn't on the herbivory. It was the trails where they walked. Uh, trampling along the edges of some of the wetlands and things that, that had an impact on, on diversity. And so what what can we do if we were trying to replace that that impact in the woods? And and one of the things that when we talk about herbivory, those are three landscape level impacts. And we're not we don't have that landscape available anymore. We're not doing things at the landscape level. We're trying to mimic them with prescribed fire at a, a lot smaller scale. And we have to do the same thing with grazing as mimic it at a smaller scale. Um, we've lopped off our best sites. Our best soils are now in ag or in development. We've lopped off we, through the, the lack of fire and overgrazing tragedy of the commons with free range. We've, we've lost um, the, the river cane thickets that were their critical winter browse. And so how do we, how do we mimic that and put these things back in the woods where it makes sense or our prairie or chenier as it, as it may be. Some of the benefits of, of conservation grazing, it offers increased forage production where we've restored some of some native prairie up in the, the Black Belt in Mississippi. Uh, during our droughts, we saw I had a lot more forage in the, the native prairie areas than we did in our quote unquote improved pasture. We have better forage in the shoulder seasons, early spring and late fall. Uh, we have a when we use conservation grazing appropriately, we have decreased fuel levels. That means we can broaden our prescribed burn window. We have less smoke and put a little bit more intense fire in there. Um, we can also decrease the negative impacts of wildfire. If it comes ro roaring through there and hits an area that's been grazed, we have lower fuels. Um, we shift understory dominance away from woody things to grasses and forbs and show an increase in native understory diversity. And that's not, all, not just grazing impacts, but it's also the hoof impacts on the changes in fire intensities that moves through that landscape and hits the, the cattle paths. Um, Mike Davis has done some recent work on that in here in South Mississippi. Uh, but this is an area that we, we need to see a lot more work done in. Uh, we can alter the successional trajectory a little bit. We get away from having so much woody understory into more fire maintained type system. And that pirate herbivory, those two things go together. They're not, um, conservation grazing isn't a star surrogate, um, although it does help things. Uh, it's putting those two things together is where we really start to see, see a difference. We can alter habitat structure. A lot of times people think about wildlife habitat and they think about, well, you know, it, it's what, what's out there, what's out there for them to eat. It's also structure. And I've yet to see an area that has good quality woodland grazing that doesn't have a good wild turkey population and a few bobwhite quail mixed in with it because it all fire and the cattle all go together and we alter the structure where it's a better habitat for those critters. Um, Increased visibility and accessibility. I'd a lot rather go try to control a privet in a thicket that the cows have been in than haven't been in. Uh, and anytime we can increase visibility, we see an increase in in small bump in timber sale. If we can even get the timber sale going right then, um, conservation grazing in the woods provides shaded areas for the livestock, which increases health. It decreases weight loss. Um, we have a potential decrease in understory management costs when we use conservation grazing. If you look at Cows in the woods versus cows in improved pasture, the cow part doesn't make as much economic sense many times, or the goat part doesn't make as much economic sense many times. But if you look at, I'm making, making a little bit or breaking even on my cattle or goats in the woods, and I've lowered my herbicide cost, I've lowered my, I've increased my burn window, increased my burn, I'm able to burn more efficiently, and it may make even better sense. Um, we also, that also, the cattle, goats also offer income diversification. Anytime you get another niche into your, your business, whether it's timber or whatever, um, then you get, you get another income stream that can help offset things during rough periods. When we saw COVID hit, the guys that had cows in the woods were able to, to sell their cows really well. Um, when you include conservation grazing silva pasture as a part of the overall management scheme for a piece of property, it may increase the optimal rotation age if you're doing even age management. That can happen where you get an increase. If you're carrying it for a longer time period, you can get an in increased return on investment. We've seen this in a couple of cases where we have a bigger shift between saw timber and poles. We have a, we're able to carry it another six years and get an increased number of poles and we bumped up our return on investment by about 2%. 
what are some of the challenges? Why, why isn't everybody doing this? Um, it's very complex. It's not easy. Um, there's a high risk of failure. It's not, you just can't put a cow or a goat or sheep in the woods and, and everything work out perfectly. It's easy to, to make a mistake and overgraze or have sick, sick animals or not get things rotated or, you know, there's lots of places where this can go south. It's not appropriate for all sites. We've lost some of our best sites and it requires a manager that's thoughtful and that understands how fire, cattle, timber, all those pieces work together. And that's unfortunately where we're, we tend to be specialists now and it really requires somebody on the ground that puts all these things together in a way that makes sense. And a lot of times when we first put cows or goats or sheep back in the woods, things are in one condition, but within four or five years, things are going to shift. We're going to see a change in understory. We may need to see a change in the way we're managing things. We may need to see a change in the way we're rotating pressure. And, and with conservation grazing, trying to mimic things on a less than landscape level, that rotational grazing is an important component. Uh, if we're doing uneven age management, we need to catch some regeneration, long leaf regeneration, and that may require some changes in our rotations. We may need to keep cows out of there for a year or two, uh, especially if we're doing um, artificial regeneration in there. Uh, there's an increased risk of invasive species establishment. The cattle trampling, goat trampling, sheep trampling the trails, got bare soil out there just waiting to catch a cogan grass seed. Uh, without the, the, the cane breaks, we need winter forage, we bring in hay, we have an increased risk of bringing in something we don't want. Uh, if we're applying herbicides in, in part of that shift and trying to control some invasive species and we're still grazing it, then we need to apply a herbicide that's labeled for range use or else rotate that grazing unit out of the herbicide rotation for the, the period of time that says so in the label. So it may be require some difference in increased management complexity again uh, with Cattle trails and grazing, we may have an increased risk of erosion and siltation. We've got increased liability exposure. What happens when the cows get out and get on the road? What happens when the cows or goats get out and eat your neighbor's azaleas or your neighbor's sunflowers? Um, we have an increased daily responsibility to check on the cows, make sure they goats, sheep, make sure they've got water, make sure they're rotating in, the, in our grazing paddocks appropriately. Um, and we have increased capital expenses. If you don't have a good fence around your property, it's hard to uh, put animals on your property. So backing up to, to Aldo Leopold's wildlife management tools, the cow, the plow, the gun, the ax, and the match, conservation grazing isn't an end to itself. Yeah, conservation grazing can do all those things we, we just talked about when applied appropriately. Um, the ax, you know, the... the the timber is a part of it, but if we're trying to maintain the system, we've got other benefits. And so thinking about conservation grazing, not as an act in itself, but as a tool that's integrated with all of our other tools, especially fire uh, and especially timber management, when we put all those three things together, then that helps us reach our long-term objective. And so with conservation, conservation grazing, it's not just the cow, it's the how. It's not a magic bean, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, putting cows or goats or sheep in the woods isn't going to, one time isn't going to really do anything. It's a rotational long-term piece of the puzzle uh, that's applied in a certain way, and it, it can be complex. Eric, back to you. All right. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Robert. That was, that was excellent. Um, yeah, you brought up a lot of a lot of really great points. And I, I think uh, I forgot to mention this earlier on in the intro, but uh, a big goal of, of this conversation that we're having today in webinar is to get people more familiar and thinking about what the, the research and management needs are and how those things could tie together uh, so that we can look into a lot of those challenges that Robert List it off and and help address those and figure out you know exactly how we need to do things in different areas so that we can start using this tool a little bit more. But um, next up uh, we have Brandon Waltman with uh, NRCS in Louisiana. He's the um, assistant state soil scientist, and so I'll turn it over to to you, Brandon. Yeah, let me just get my screen up. Make sure I'm yeah. sharing the right one. So it's showing like the slide, the, uh, yeah, not the okay. presenter yet. Gotcha. All right. What about now? There you go. Perfect. 
Cool. Thank well, uh, it, we're good to go. Yep, all good. All right, cool deal. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Waltman. I am the Assistant State Soil Scientist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in the great state of Louisiana. Um, today, we're going to talk. I'm going to focus a little bit more, I guess you could say, on the underground herd, uh, that aspect of herbivory and how that influences the soil microbiological communities and how we improve soil health and how can soil health be improved in our, these grazing systems and why it's important. Um, Robert did a great job talking about this. So I had just this one slide I wanted to quickly go over, but um I mean, he said it great. You know, most ecosystems along the Gulf Coast are the products of the natural and historic disturbance regimes. Um, when we talk about natural, and I'm going to focus more on soils today, but, you know, you're looking at things that are not, are not easily changed, right? The climate, soils, uh, the water regimes, et cetera, things do change with time. There's no doubt about it. But uh, we also have those extreme weather events, uh, hurricanes, and so on and so forth. Uh, but herbivory, you know, it's it is a disturbance, but it can be a positive disturbance in the grand scheme of things. And like uh, Robert mentioned, herbivory and fire go hand in hand. Having natural fires that came through these ecosystems ended up driving, you know, was a strong ecosystem driver. Um, we're starting to see now that excluding or limiting uh, these prehistoric disturbances, you know, can have a do have a negative impact on plant and soil microbial community dynamics um you know i know we do a lot of managed forests and and we're talking more or less in this case about the understory the understories uh communities have drastically shifted with how we manage our forest now and you know bringing herbivory in and and if we, where we can fire back into the system does improve that above ground biodiversity and below ground biodiversity um, you know, these animals create a positive feedback loop that we're wanting to put in here through grazing, through the trampling, through disturbance, and where they urinate and defecate. And those are spots of nutrient loads, high fertility that can be. This is about distributing these appropriately, appropriately in, in these uh, in these forested ecosystems. But uh, so the introduction of herbivory and following proper grazing management can positively impact the health of our soils along the Gulf Coast. So when we talk about the health of soils, let's just a quick overview. Of what is soil health and why does it matter? So what is soil health? Well, we, we define it as the capacity of a specific soil to function and uh, highlighted function there because that's the key th point I want to make here as a vital living system. And we want this living ecosystem to sustain plants, animals and human productivity. We want the appropriate nutrient cycling put in place that and through this nutrient cycling, it helps provide physical stability and support for the plants that we're looking to put out Um and also the tree ecosystems and the in in the uh, the herbivores that we're looking to put out there as well. Uh, we want these soils to maintain or enhance water and air quality. We want it, want it to act as a filter, and that's what soils naturally do. They act as filters and they buffer. Um, and we provide a habitat for biodiversity. Again, talking about above ground biodiversity and below ground biodiversity. And you, this right here, you can just pretty much starts with the sun. And we're going to talk more about that when I get to the biology section is using trying to be light farmers, using sunlight, radiation, free energy to convert that energy into sugars to feed the below ground biology to provide these functions for us. And it, all these functions are directly affected by the amount and size of the pore spaces in the soil, which I'll talk about as we go down the road. The amount of soil carbon, which is a huge driving point, it carbon fuels the system. So we need as much carbon pumped into the soils to help fuel this biological ecosystem to produce these functions we want to have. Um, and it's all about management. You know, we're talking about uh, grazing these ecosystems right now incorporating incorporating herbivory back into our forested ecosystems but so that's a management shift instead of just having a traditional forest stand with a lot of mechanical treatment compaction stuff like that changes in management uh can significantly improve these soil functions and it, and it all relates back to soil biology so when we talk about soil function we're looking primarily at four ecosystem processes. And the key point on this for sure is to mention that 90% of the functions of soils across the globe 
is mediated by soil microbes. So when we talk about soil microbes, first and foremost, or these, sorry, these four ecosystem processes, let's talk about the carbon cycle real fast. We are literally taking sunlight energy, free energy, putting it on a leaf, which acts as a solar panel. And then as that leaf photosynthesizes, it is pumping carbon, a lot of carbon, a lot of root exudates, sugars, complex proteins into the ground that this microbial herd below the ground ends up eating and recycling back into the system. It's a really critical point that drives the rest of the biocommunity cycle, the water cycles, and the nutrient cycle. So by having these carbon sources, these diverse plants, you're bringing in, well, and you already kind of have it, you have the forest working to your advantage. So you, in in essence, you could have a really good micro mycorrhizal fungi community already put in place. So you have the fungal community being put into place. And then with the X, with the increased carbon cycle, you have that bacterial community being uh, put into place. Those are working in symbiotic relationships together, which drives the increased bio community cycle. And so it increases the food web. And I have a slide talking about that in just a minute. But it also, over time, improves water infiltration and availability. So we're talking about building soil organic matter in the grand scheme of things. That's how we usually equate it to when we're trying to improve soil health and improve soil function. The building of organic matter allows more water to soak into the ground instead of running off. We have deeper infiltration so we can have that water stored for future available use during droughty times like we just went through, especially here in Louisiana. Um, but also this community drives the nutrient cycle. You got to have a really well-balanced nutrient cycle to have a healthy soil ecosystem. Um, and, and all of this provides great, again, great habitat for biodiversity, filtering and buffering, the physical stability and support that we talked about just a little while ago. So why does soil health matter? Well, between 01 and 2016, Americans paved over, built up, or compromised 11 million acres of farmland and ranch land. So it was roughly about 2,000 acres a day. Um, we, it, it, we in NRCS, we also look at prime farmland conversions. We have a lot of prime farmland that's get, getting converted, you know, to urbanization into other land uses. So we're starting to lo we're losing that land pretty much into perpetuity, um, and we're not gaining land. I know y'all definitely know that but we are losing a lot of our our great our good farmland our good grazing lands um and the u.s is home to 10 percent of the earth's arable soils the most of any country on earth so we're already stockpiled with that great ground that we have and we're losing it at a steady rate so we feed the world i mean the world population is projected to increase to 2050 or to 9 billion in 2050 so to sustain this level of food production uh food production will need to rise by 70%. So we're working with less land, more people. How do we get more food produced that's environmentally friendly and soil friendly, really, in the grand scheme of things? Um, so the key to that is improving soil health. It's the key to long-term sustainable agricultural production. And again, healthy soils, in essence, are high-performing. They're productive soils. These soils over time can help reduce production costs and improve profits. Um, they protect the natural resources, not only on the farm or in the, in the area that we're concentrating on, but off farm. You know, you have less sediment runoff in the grand scheme of things. You have more infiltration in, in, in the area that you're targeting. So that'd be less water runoff to other areas, uh, less uh, nutrient runoff. And we want these functions to be in place. And, um, FDR said it back 85 years ago, and it's still true today, that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. So what do we want our soils to do? We want our soils to produce the food, feed, fibers, the biofuels, the medicine. We want it to capture the, and filter the water. And y'all know better than anybody, uh, South in the southern region of the U.S., we get a tremendous amount of rain. We want that rain to be captured and filtered into the ground and filtered into the soils. We want to cycle and recycle nutrients. We want to be drought and flood resistant. We want to protect plants from pathogens and stress. We want to detoxify any pollutants that get into the environment and store carbon and moderate the release of gases. You know, with climate change, uh, we want to have that carbon 
stored from the atmosphere back into the ground. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. And also we want it to resist erosive forces. When improving soil health usually comes with a reduction in erosion because of that building of organic matter. So when we talk about uh, soil function and soil health, the way we really look at it, we're looking at trying to change management, a shift in paradigm in management paradigms to um, to have these systems put in place again to improve soils. There are certain soil properties that we're targeting. We're looking at dynamic soil properties. Uh, you have, we usually break our soil properties up into three categories. We have physical soil properties, chemical soil properties, and dynamic soil properties. Typically the physical and chemical, well, especially the physical, those things are extremely hard to change like soil textures, clays versus silt loams versus sands. Um, we can improve the structure of soils through management by building that organic matter. It helps build a better soil structure. But a lot of physical properties are not easily changed, especially in our lifetime. So when we talk about improving soil health, through soil health management systems, we're really targeting dynamic soil properties. So building that organic matter content through improving the biological activity, building soil aggregates, improving infiltration, re uh, reducing bulk density, and bulk density is usually related to compaction. So the high, more compact that a soil is, the higher the bulk density, the less water that soaks into the ground. Um, and overall, we wanna improve soil, uh, soil fertility. So we got to think of the soil as a living factory. It's full of macroscopic and microscopic organisms that provide, they need to be managed in order for soil microbes to provide these functions. Um, but the system is powered by sunlight. That's a huge key point that I've mentioned and I'll continue to mention as we go along. Uh, so we have to look at our management systems. When we think about soils as a living factory, what management systems can we put into place that you know, would improve and not degrade? Um, in conventional ag, you know, we, we talk about, you know, tillage practices. Again, tillage is a tool, but if we can reduce some semblance of reduced tillage, reduce fertilizer inputs, over time, hopefully reduce pesticide inputs, we're letting the soils function for us and they can help buffer those impacts that we're trying to chemically and physically apply to the ground. And through grazing and plant diversity, we can improve these, the, these soil functions in the health of our soils. So, Again, it starts with soil biology. It's all about biology and it all starts with sunlight. The, the biology feed on the carbs that is put into the ground by the plants and it just stair steps from there, right? So you have organic matter getting recycled from the, the leaves and the roots and stuff that die and get put into the ground. But then you have a lot of organics that are getting put into the system, organic matter that's getting put into the system through root exudates, microbes and fungi feeding on these root exudates, dying and then recycling these nutrients back into the system. But up the food chain, everything relies on, again, the sun and the plants working in relationship with the biology below to the ground to support the system. Because without biology, soil is just geology. When we're looking at the miracle of photosynthesis, again, a lot of carbon is put into the ground through roots in the form of these sugars and complex uh, compounds that the biology feeds on. And this right here is a really good slide of, of a root tip, um, sh releasing these root exudates. Um, and we, again, 90% of the, the soil function is mediated by microbes. So these microbes are immediately around this root eating and feeding on this free carbohydrates and then in turn recycling the nutrients and building the organics that the plants can use immediately and then going into, into perpetuity. So there's at least 2,000 pounds of soil microbes in each acre of healthy soil, which is the weight of two cows. It's, tr it's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. Uh, soil biology is responsible, again, for 90% of the soil function. So when we look at soil organisms, we, we broadly classify them into three groups, ecosystem engineers, chemical processors, biological regulators. Uh, and the key point is that all these organisms, all three, all organisms and all three groups contribute to incorporating carbon into the soil system. And you can see 
a flow chart essentially of the ecosystem engineers, biological regulators, biochemical engineers, and what they individually do like ecosystem engineers, their primary task is to build building soil, creating aggregates and pores, but their, their other the other function they do provide is decomposition and, and carbon cycling. Again, carbon is what fuels the ecosystem. So you can see how all of these work in relationship to build carbon to increase to improve nutrient cycling and plant productivity. So this is just a chart showing typical numbers of soil in organisms in various ecosystems. Um, cropland croplands are typically more bacterial dominated. Uh, especially in conventional croplands where you're you're going in there and plowing up soils, breaking any kind of fungal networks, hyphae networks that are getting put into place, uh, more or less is bacterially dominated uh, versus the prairie where you're starting to get more fungi being put into the system versus the forest, which has miles of fungal networks. Uh, so like I was saying earlier, having this forested ecosystem already put into place and incorporating herbivory into the system uh, I mean, you're already ahead of the game in terms of building that fungal network. We want that fungal network built, and I'll talk about why in just a few. But when we talk about soil organisms, where do they live? Well, they live in the spaces between aggregates. They live on the surface of soil aggregates. So this right here is a slide shot, uh, a, a um, picture of just micro aggregates. So when we think of aggregates, we're looking at a piece of soil being held in the hand. Then you have all these other little micro aggregates that are built within that larger complex and a lot of stable organic matter is held onto these aggregates or held in these aggregates this stable carbon and that's what we want to see and that's built by biology they live in the humus they live around roots uh, a lot a lot of bacteria is found around roots because that's an easy carbon source again not only for the actual plant matter that's there but because of the root exodus that are being put out and they also live in litter. So we, we have that above ground detritus being incorporated back into the soil. Um, so we have different pathways that organics are being put into the soil in different areas where these organisms live. So one of the one of the big sticking points that we like to talk about is fungal relationships with plants, creating that symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. So this right here is a picture showing all these fungal uh, hyphae or these filaments penetrating a root hair essentially. So the root hair can only mine so much nitrogen, phosphorus and other macronutrients and micronutrients immediately around it. Well, what the mycorrhizal fungi do is they tap into that root and they can extra extract phosphorus and other elements from further distances and bring it back to that root. And what the root in turn is doing is feeding that fungi, all that carbon source that we talked about just a little while ago. Um, that they add extensive surface area and volume to the system. And so what we like to see when we talk about a functioning soil health system is this relationship between fungal networks and the bacterial networks with the root system put into place. And there's a great slide right here to show that relationship. So this is what we call rise of sheaths. Um, I've seen this to an extent. I haven't seen it this dramatic. But when you pull a plant, a grass, in this case grass, out of the ground, and you see all these little micro aggregates immediately around that root that that, that you can see with the naked eye, these roots, the it, it's a root sheath. I mean, it's full of nutrients. It's full of fungi, and all of this, the this essentially this soil that's attached to here is hanging on by biological glues and all the other complicated networks of the mycorrhizal fungi is, is pretty interesting to see. But this is our sign of a healthy, improved soil. So um, the process, when we talk about aggradation, we, we're looking at it as a stair-step method. So you, we like to break it up between things that you can't see and things that you can see, right, or you can see noticeable changes. So Really, the first thing would be like biological activity. I mean, you can't see it with the naked eye, but by improving species diversity in these in these forested ecosystems under in in the understory per se, per se, and improving that that species richness, you're improving that biological activity below the ground. You're bringing in different root systems that bring in different organisms that want to come to the table. Um, you're driving that biological function. And over time, that biological system builds up. 
the 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 bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, they they die, then their bodies are considered a necromass, and so that's also a nutrient rich area that these plants uh, can take into the nutrients, and that material becomes more stable organic carbon. So you had that organic matter turnover and improved nutrient cycling over time as a stair step, right? So then you start seeing some things with the naked eye. You, dig, you put a shovel into the ground, pop that shovel out of the ground, and say you had you know, some semblance of compaction, some platy structure layers, which is a, a you know, primary indicator of soil compaction. You see things uh, start to improve. I'm starting to see better aggregation. I'm starting to see stuff around these roots like we just talked about with the root sheaths. I'm starting to notice that when it rains, my water's not standing on the ground. It's actually getting soaking into the soil or it's infiltrating deeper into the profile. Those are the things that we can see with the naked eye to help verify that the management systems that we're putting into place is improving soil function. So you got to treat as a stair step method and it's not an overnight thing it's not a flip of the switch it takes time to build there's no doubt about it but we can improve that by incorporating herbivory and improving soil organic matter so soil organic matter is about less than six percent of the soil by weight but it drives 90 percent of the function i keep saying that but i just want to keep reiterating that um, it holds about 18 to 20 times its weight in water uh, so essentially 1% of organic matter in the top six inches of the soil would hold approximately 27,000 gallons of water. 1% uh, organic matter measured in soil, and we look at it in percent terms, right? Oh, you know, conventional ag fields that are heavily tilled are going to be 1% or less, and we want to see that number improve in the systems that we're talking about. Uh, so every 1% measured in soil can hold about an inch of water, which is tremendous with the amount of rain that we get and how much water actually runs off our fields. Um, it actually is, and it, it can bind both cations and anions. So we think of soils with cation exchange capacity. Um, they, they, uh, they, bind, they hold nutrients, but soil organic matter uh, holds a lot more than say, you know, your two to one clays that, that can take in a lot of, uh, a lot of cations. And this is two pro primary processes that we build soil organic matter. We're really focused on the right hand side. It's kind of a complicated one, but what we're looking at doing is entombing organic matter. We want to build as much stable organic carbon as possible. And that is done via the root exudates and the microorganisms feeding on that and turning that or in the fungi as well, but turning those organisms more or less into stable soil organic carbon. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated process, there's no doubt about it, but we want that fungi and bacteria relationship to be put in place over time that builds that stable pool that's not readily oxidized by micro or oxidized and eaten up by microbes and it's lost back to the environment. So microbial metabolic processes um, or the microbial and carbon pump is critical. Um, and we were now we know that these plant root exudates are recognized as constituting the primary pathway for building soils and building soil function. And this right here is a slide uh, of, of a soil aggregates with the polysaccharides, the sugars that are that are in white and the clay particles that are kind of that dark color with the bacteria moving around it. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like in, you know, under the microscope. And the way we do that is we follow these soil health principles of minimal disturbance, maximizing soil cover, providing continuous living roots, and maximizing biodiversity. We look at it in the terms of feeding and then covering. So we got to protect the soil like an armor, but we also got to feed that below ground biology, keep a stable carbon source in play at all times. When we talk about grazing, and Robert did a good job talking about this a little while ago, you know, we're looking at some advantages of grazing grasslands and forest lands for soil health. You can see some listed here, you know, high quality and quantity, qual quantity and quality, quality of forage for livestock from perennials. Um, you know, it, it can help reduce evaporation, improve infiltration. Um, it can improve plant diversity too. You have these cows that are grazing plants and then they're pooping them out and it's, it's spreading the good plants we see over time. It could reduce the need from mechanical harvest. It can add biology at a faster rate, improve our soils at a faster rate. Um, it can also improve, uh, in, it can in, uh, improve our drought and wildfire resistance. And of course you can have overall improved animal health. And manure is important. And I'm not going to go through all these, but you can see the functions of manure in its system. And it, it's 
it, it's, it's tremendous. You, you know, you're, you're increasing the below ground microbial biomass, but you also have those, those uh, macro arthropods that you can see, they're actually taking in those or that organic matter and pulling it back into the ground. So manure is an extremely important part of this ecosystem. Um, without animal inputs, this is a carbon cycle without livestock, just a kind of a boring carbon cycle is not very complicated. You know, plants take in carbon dioxide, uh, you know, and, and from a respiration aspect, we have uh, soil organic matter that's being eaten can release carbon dioxide. But with herbivores introduced, soil microbes can take in the carbon and alter it and make it more stable and, and available for use going down the road. And, uh, you know, we with carbon, you got to have an, a, a good amount of nitrogen also. So to, to build these complex carbon networks, you need nitrogen and animals are a key part of that and, and putting nitrogen back into the ground um, through the manure and, and, and urination. Um, prescribed grazing is the key to soil health. You know, we, we, we I'm not going to go more or less into this, but we, the overall thought is we want to try to rotate the animals the best way we can um, and not overgraze the system. We want to keep some plant matter on top of the ground so it can photosynthesize and put root exodus back into the ground to feed that bi microbial herd. Um, and we got to, we got to follow some pre uh, prescribed grazing methods. You got to have good water placement. Uh, you don't want, you want to minimize that trafficking. You don't want them keep going back to the same place over and over and compacting that ground trailing. We want to avoid the overgrazing. Um, and typically this is a great slide that shows the prescribed grazing versus overgrazing. So the concept is to take half, leave half, rotate the cows out. We want that, we want that leaf matter on top of the ground to produce those photosynthates for the, for the, for the below ground biology, because it takes leaves to make more leaves into feed soils and microbial life. Um, so I would say, let me skip one more slide. I would say that, you know, these are our four soil health principles I showed earlier, but really there's a fifth principle and that's including livestock. And you can, you can, you can almost say that, you know, you can put that into lumping it with maximized biodiversity, but livestock are such a cru crucial part, especially the ecosystem systems that we're talking about today and in terms of improving soils and, and putting them in our soil health management systems. So the key points to take away are soils are major drivers in all ecosystems, and they significantly affect how we use and manage the land. Soil biology is the key to soil function and increased organic matter content. Um, soil function and organic matter are built by the addition of carbon. So carbon cycle, putting carbon into the ground is key. Uh, by enhancing the biodiversity, species richness above ground, uh, biodiversity is enhanced below the ground. So improper land management is the key to improving soil health. So we want to look, we want to go from something that looks like this heavily compacted to something that looks pretty daggum healthy. It looks almost cottage cheese like it has that good aggregation. There's good organics put into the system for future use. And this right here is my contact info. Um, and I know this is recorded, but if y'all have any questions, feel free to get in contact with me. And Eric, that is all I had on my presentation. I know it went a smidge over time. No, it, it's all good. All, all good info. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, no problem. And uh, so I, I, I'll just reemphasize that if y'all do have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat, but also we'll have a question and answer portion at the, at the end once we're done with all the presenters too. So um, feel free to put those in there and we'll get to them during the Q&A part. Uh, so next up, we have Rocky Lemus, and he is with Mississippi State University Extension as a forage specialist and a research professor. So uh, thanks for starting to share the screen, Rocky. Um, there we go. It looks perfect on my end. Take it away. Thank you, uh, Eric, for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm more into uh, the grazing systems in Mississippi. Uh, I'm the extension for especially, but also I'm the leader for the Center for Forest Management and Environmental Stewardship, where we try to introduce not only grazing management, but also make sure that those practices are environmentally sound and, and protecting some of the resources that we have across the state and across the South. So I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of some of the things that we need to think about when we uh, look at 
uh, wildlife forage and, and how it can be managed. You know, it's a little bit different than managing an open grazing system uh, like we have in North Mississippi compared to what we see in coastal areas. So let me see if I can get this to move. There you go. Uh, one thing that I think is very important is that um, I think it, this has been mentioned already a couple of times, is looking at what are the benefits on grazing in coastal habitats. There's going to be a little bit more uh, sensi sensitivity to what we do in those areas because we are ha also having to protect uh, water bodies, uh, migration systems. So one thing that I think is very important, especially when we're looking at the pine belt, is the reduction of risk of fires, wildfire, especially if we look at the issues that we have this year with the drought situation we have across uh, quite a bit of the uh, south, that could be a, an, an impact in there. Uh, we want to make sure that we are also enhancing the habitat for both native grassland plants and animals. Uh, uh, if we look at uh, South Mississippi, South Louisiana, South Alabama, especially, we have a lot also introducing introduced species that will fit into the system, and we'll talk about some of them later on. But also maintaining an open character of our coastal prairies and pine systems. Uh, and this can also provide opportunity to provide more grazing land to a local rancher. So especially if we look at uh, the southern part of uh, the southern United States, so South Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, is the core for also for the livestock and stocker operations across the southern United States. So we have to make sure that we're integrating those systems as part of that as well. So just to give you a, a quick overview here, when we look at the uh, uh, the longleaf pine area across the south, we you see that you have a lot of acres all the way from the North Carolina into the um, um, northeast Louisiana into Mississippi. So they're basically for the flag, what we call the flagwood ecoregion of this area. So this flatwood ecoregion mainly is is going to be maintained by wild uh, wildfire prescribed fire that's going to dominate that longleaf pine or loblawny pine areas. So if we try to integrate systems in there, especially for years, and try to integrate grazing system along with these uh, uh, wooded areas, it's very important that um, that then we utilize fire. And to maintain those that balance, we weren't going to be looking at fire that's going to be every two or three years instead of something that we might be only once every year if you only use it for controlling vegetation on a pine system. And there's a lot of warm season grasses and forbs in these uh, systems that can provide quite a bit of forage for our livestock. Uh, depending on where you're at, that can range from 2,500 to about 4,000 pounds of forage production yearly. Uh, one thing that we have to uh, concentrate here is that sometimes of the grazing management that we're going to see with the systems are going to be a little bit different that we have in an open grazing system. Usually when we talk about uh, open grazing system, we talk about how many cows per acre. And this type of system, we have to be the opposite. We have to look at how many acres per cow. So basically to maintain one cow in one of the systems, we might be looking for, uh, about average about 10 acres, depending on the management can range from five to 10 acres. Another thing that is very important to maintain that balance is that for those grasses or species that we want to be able to graze, light penetration becomes a major component in that. If you don't have enough light penetration, there's not going to be photosynthesis, there's not going to be uh, the opportunity for those um, uh, grasses to be able to thrive or new seed to be able to germinate and be able to continue the system. So another thing that we need to think about, especially in those coastal areas, is that we need to think about salt marshes management. You know, there is a lot of grasses on these areas and, and how we manage is going to be a little bit different than we're going to do with the management that you're going to see with the, uh, the pine belt. And the reason for that is because these salt marsh uh, systems also are important grassland ecosystems. Uh, they support a large number of communities. So you have invertebrates in there, you have breeding, uh, wintering migratory birds. That's the one thing that we see this time of the year happening quite a bit. Um, we also have a lot of number of ecosystem systems system in there. Tidal defense, recreation, water quality, carbon storage. So grazing is a very important part of maintaining the functions and these uh, marsh systems. 
And one thing to me is to make sure that there's not a lot of overgrazing. Uh, because also another thing is that if we abandon uh, grazing or we overgraze the systems, they're gonna uh, gonna be linked to some decline in biodiversity on on that. So we wanna make sure that we utilize that to balance that system. Most of these grazing marshes are gonna be used maybe for cattle. So I think that's gonna be one of the uh, the things that we need to address uh, because you know small room in a mine will be what we wanna be able to have in these open uh, or more open systems. Uh, one thing that you will see the benefit with grazing in this system might be the reduction on fine grain soils, uh, making those soil margin more resilient to erosion as well. Uh, however, one thing that we need to be careful is that compaction uh, by cattle can also lower the elevation of the march. So the, the grazing system is going to be one of those that have to be very well uh, planned ahead of time. Um, because if we start lowering the elevation of those marshes, also can impart the ability to to have uh, keep up with that sea level rise, especially on on the climate changes that we're seeing right now. So we're looking more at a, what we call a moderate or rotational livestock grazing. That's what I would recommend in these systems. Uh, we cannot use a high intensity grazing uh, uh, approach in this system. So. So keep that in mind. So one thing that we need to do also when we look at this, this system is what we call more, what I call a targeted grazing system. And depending on the function that you have on those, we'll be able to have a livestock grazing or browsing to achieve landscape managing goals. And if you look at the map uh, on your upper right, just to give an idea what are the uh, different grassland regions that we have across the Northeast. Uh, so if you look down in South Mississippi, Louisiana into Florida, we're more in those called the coastal pine savanna systems. So, so what we're looking at is what we call short periods of high intensity. Uh, to reduce the presence of, of bigger pest plants, but as part of the management plan, but also to maintain some of those grasses more, more uh, productive and a better quality. Um, you know, this term also has been used in the past as reduction of plant cover to reduce fire risk. And I think that's an added bonus with that. And one thing that we were talking about targeted system is we want to make sure that those plants are going to be competitive, you're going to be able to recover very quickly. And if you look at that, that figure on your lower on the lower right hind side is give an idea of what happened when we talk about targeted systems. So so we want to make sure that we remo we're removing enough forage or leaving enough forage for that root system to continue to thrive, be able to hold that soil in place, maintain that soil health like have been mentioned in the past, but also be able to recover faster. So we're talking about systems that might be removing uh, 40 to 50 percent of the uh, uh, plant cover instead of a more intensive system where we're looking at removing 70 or 90 percent of that system where we are really impacting that root system. We are delaying uh, grass growth and recovery as well. So the selection of the livestock type is another thing that we need to think about. And that's going to be dependent on what you manage the goals going to be and what forage are available. Uh, you know, if we have cattle, cows, we calf, they're going to tend to, pre to prefer grasses. So, so they tend also to, we have to think about their behavior. Uh, they tend to prefer feeding close to water. So within a half mile on areas with gentle slope under 20%. Uh, cattle are going to be more effective at removing grassy fuel. Uh, cattle yearlings tend to feed on long distance from water, really utilize areas in, of steep terrain. That's what we have most of the stocky cattle doing usually in the wintertime. But also we can incorporate sheep or goat. Sheep tend to uh, eat more forbs, such as clovers, dandelions, or the broadleaf plants, when the goats tend to eat more shrubs to a lesser extent what we call forbs or grasses. And goats also have more effect at removing some small woody materials. Anything that's lower than an inch is usually very easy for the goats to remove. So one thing that we need to make sure is that we utilize in animals, they're going to consume most of the plants equally. So that can actually have uh, to maintain that, that, that balance and not leading more to a shift in, in plant, plant species if we're overgrazing. And sometimes in the systems, what can in, we can incorporate what we call a mix, mixed grazing systems. Usually you will have cattle and goats in there. 
or, or sheep and cattle. Uh, especially sheep and goats, they tend to be more what I call top browsers. They like that early, more tender type of uh, uh, material that is available when the cattle can come behind and actually be able to utilize some of the more mature uh, forages that, that might be in that system as well. So I give you an advantage to have to actually have less selectively. It's sometimes in the system to have a more complete uniform balance on that. Just to give an idea, when we look at the uh, the percent of time animals spend feeding in different plant types, you see here that cattle is going to prefer more grasses, while sheep is going to produce prefer also grasses, but goats are going to produce uh, going to graze more on the fourth side and also browse more than some of the other species, especially with cattle. So sometimes cattle and goats might be a good, a good example of that, especially in areas where you have pine woods, where those grow, goats can actually graze those shrubs, those brambles, and open that canopy for the cattle to get in there and then start grazing some of the grasses that might be available as well. So one thing that I usually, when I work with producers in those areas, uh, the pine woods cattle is probably one that is going to be the preferred. Uh, the reason for that, they're going to be more heat tolerant, they're more long lived, they're more resistant to parasites and diseases, and be able to be more productive and marginal forage. Remember that when we're talking about pine wood cattle, the, those cattle go into those areas, they might, we might not see it for, for a long period of time. They might be there for, for months at a time. So be able to have something that is more resistant to parasites and diseases in those type of systems become very important. But also when we look at goats, uh, breed of goats that, that I would recommend in this type of system, I'm going to look at, at what I call meat goats type. Uh, Kiko is one. Boar or a Kiko boar cross are usually more resistant to parasite and more adapted to that. One of the, that's one of the, the disadvantages that we have with small rumen in the south is because our hot and humid conditions, parasite, parasites tend to thrive more in those environments. So having a species that are going to be more resistant to that is very important. Another thing that is very important from the managed point of view is that uh, we want to make sure that we're introducing goats in the system, so we're introducing them in areas that are more the, the pine trees are more mature, as you see in the picture in the, uh, to your lower left, where some of these goats can actually remove the bark of the, uh, some of the, uh, the pine trees, and eventually those pine trees are going to die. So you want to make sure that those, those pine trees are mature enough, they're not going to uh, su suffer so much damage from, uh, from some of these uh, small ruminant species. Uh, the grazing and timing and seasonalities is another thing that we, we need to think about. Uh, there might be areas that you might be able to do rotations year-round, but areas that you might not. So, so when we look at that, we look at usually uh, what I consider three areas, and it's based on what will be available. Usually in the fall and winter grazing, cattle tends to use more annual grasses. So this is usually going to encourage more forbs, including wheat species. Uh, some of them might be palatable to the animals, some of them might be palatable to a small ruminants. Uh, and the spring grazing, we see that that is a good time for livestock gaining because grasses and forests are going to be highly nutritious. They're going to be more new growth coming in there that will more, be more, more palatable, more high in, in, in new minerals and, and sugars and proteins that the animals can utilize. And when we get to summer, we see that this is a period that even though we have uh, some grasses in there, uh, the forest value tends to decrease. So, so you might have to have areas that that the livestock might be concentrated to utilize shrubs or pines for forage. So depending on that, you can actually be able to do that. But also we can incorporate in some of those areas, if you have areas that you use cattle and, and, and goats and you start opening that canopy where there's more light penetration, there are some species, cool season grasses, such as annual ryegrass or small grains that might be able to be utilized in those systems. Um, but also we might be able to, to extend that grazing season in there. Just to give an idea, I'm going to talk about some of the native species as well, but just to give you an idea that sometimes we, we have also a lot of introduced species that we can use in the systems. But one thing that is so important when we talk about uh, these grazing systems in the coastal area is that we need to find species that are going to be more resistant to salinization and shading. 
Why? Because soil salinity reduces forage yield and alters also the mineral composition of the forage that can also imbalance some of the systems. Uh, but also shading. Uh, we need to find species that cannot be more shaded resistant. They'll be able to compete in those areas in those cooler environments, moist environments, and still be able to provide forage for those uh, last, different type of livestock. Uh, one of them is bahia grass. Bahia grass is very short, shade tolerant. That's why probably you see there is a lot of bahia grass growing in south, in the southern part of the uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Has higher yields on the 50% sh shade than in in full sunlight. So there's an advantage you have in that system initially because in that conditions, we see that tend to have a, a better nutrition as well. They have good salt tolerance and good drought tolerance. So it's, this is a species that I start opening some of those systems. Uh, you want to introduce some of the species, probably by hair grass is the one that I will recommend to use on that. Uh, Bermuda grass is not such a great opportunity in those systems. Uh, even though it have good drought tolerance, it have poor shade tolerance and moderate soil tolerance. So, so that's some of the limitations that you're going to see with Bermuda grass in those systems. Annual ryegrass uh, is one that can fit into the system because it's very shade tolerant as well. High productivity in the wintertime, but I have moderate salinity uh, with uh, plant survival ranging from 70 to 80 percent in those in those moderate salinity systems. But also we might be able to introduce some, some um, uh, shade tolerant uh, legumes sometimes, and probably white clover is the one that's going to fit better into the systems. Uh, not so much right out than the right there where you have high salinity levels because it doesn't have good salinity tolerance uh, in the system, but can in, be introduced in some open canopy uh, pine wood systems to, to provide some higher nutrition but also be able to start nucle uh, some nutrient cycling, nitrogen cycling in those systems. There is a large number also of what I call native species that can uh, that have been already adapted to these areas and we can utilize to, to uh, provide to the livestock. Chalky bluff stem, blue stem is one of them. It's very palatable grass. Um, one thing that's established naturally are muckland soils that have been idle for one to two years. So it can be uh, very invasive in those areas. Um, it can be viable in protecting these soils against erosion as well. Um, it can be maintained for the plant, plant composition graceable woodlands. Uh, it can undergo good management as well. It's one of the first grasses to become established in a range that have been overgrazed. Uh, so you might see that uh, as you start overgrazing some areas, the chalky uh, blue stem might start transitioning that ecological association as well. And annual burning reduces the stem. So that's something that if you use in burning in, in this area, something that you might want to consider as well. Uh, the uh, Pine Hill blue stem is another one. Um, it provides high quality forage, um, remains uh, green until late fall and moisture is available, uh, can support close grazing uh, as well. So, uh, I mean, close grazing can actually reduce and kill some of these plants. So, so for maximum production, we usually recommend not to graze more than 50%. Well, and that's probably one thing that we recommend with most of these native grasses is that you leave quite a bit of biomass. So uh, some of these grasses, you might have to leave about six to eight inches residual biomass for them to actually be able to, uh, to be productive and, and be able to recover very quickly as well. Uh, the arrow feather throne is one of those that actually we see quite a bit on this area, especially throughout the southeast, especially in those uh, coastal area. It grows best in sandy soils. It, it tolerates more, moderate shade, so it fits very well into the systems. Um, it, it is grazed by cat a few weeks in early spring. So uh, one of the problems that we see is that it produces low quality forage for the rest of the years. So, so you might have some limitation in there when it comes to making sure that the cattle is getting what they need for, for production as well. It will stand annual burning very well as well. So, so some of the species will fit into the ecological, ecological association very well. Um, what we call the giant cane, uh, we see this quite a bit in those areas as well, especially in some of the areas of the marshes. Uh, the giant cane can provide high quality forage for cattle, horses, and sheep. Um, one thing is that 
they can be killed very easily if you're overgrazing or you're doing uncontrolled burning. Um, like I mentioned before, this will require at least no more than 50% of maximum production uh, grazing every year to maintain uh, those, those grasses. Um, one thing is that overgrazing the stand also require complete protection from grazing and fire during the growing season. That allows the plants to also to be able to regain some type of vigor. Uh, the Virginia wild rye, I think, is one of the most probably the most important species that we can have because it's very native to our area. It grows mainly in so most soils and woodlands along drainage ways uh, that overflows occasionally. So it can be very productive. And if most of the production we're going to see is in the spring into uh, probably early summer um, and also into the winter and the fall. Uh, the leaves are a very leaf material accessible to a livestock. Um, so you have to make sure that because it's highly palatable that you have some type of rest so they can be able to actually recover and, and, and be able to, to produce on the systems. Switchgrass is another one. This is very, um, very uh, adapted to our area. Uh, it's a native prairie grass. One of the advantages that you have with switchgrass is it grows very well in brackish marshes. So, so you can use it for livestock grazing. Switchgrass is very productive, especially from April until about July. That's when you're probably gonna get the best benefit for this native grass. Once you get to July and start putting seed heads, it becomes very fibrous. So that fibers goes to almost 70, 80% sometimes and protein can drop down to about 4%. So it really limits uh, into July, August, September, how much grazing you can get out of this. But early in the season, uh, targeted grazing will be very beneficial in this type of situations as well. Uh, independent which drop seed, I, I think that uh, uh, this was another one that we usually see in the pine woods. Uh, seldom grows on wet or flooded sites, so, uh, but it can be utilized and grazed mainly by the livestock and deer during the spring. Um, one thing is, is you, if you have honey drop seed and you start uh, to see an abundance of this grass, that also indicates a deterioration of the range. So that means that it can be very invasive. So we have, we're losing some of the uh, soil quality properties, some of the uh, species diversity that we have when we see that the abundance of this grass start dominating the ecosystem as well. But any, one of the problems that we have is not easily damaged by fire. So that's another thing that makes it very competitive and sometimes overtakes some of the areas where you don't want it to be so, so abundant as well. Uh, the broadleaf Unola, this is another one that uh, fits very well to what we do. It's a shade tolerant and grows in colonies. Uh, it, it grows best on the at least 40% shade. So it's very shade tolerant. Uh, it's usually managed for winter grazing as well. Um, and no more than 50% of the current growth by way should be removed during the growing season. So that, like I cannot emphasize enough is that some of these native grass that you need to make sure that you manage that targeting grazing, uh, that you're not overgrazing and maintaining the inter with enough growth to recover very well. So to give you a quick summary, uh, so planting hardy native grasses uh, can actually be able to utilize in these landscapes. They can increase uh, the land values, they can bolster uh, diversity by economy, by economy markets, and also can increase some of the ecological services, such health, uh, water quality, habitat. One thing that when it comes to the livestock grazing, uh, this is the most cost-effective method for habitat management in those areas but also make sure that the method requiring the most of the management, okay? Grazing during duration, intensity, the livestock, the time of grazing activity, all of those can drastically affect the success of the grazing strategy. So it's very important that you pay attention to those. Uh, cattle and goats will be what I, I recommend to be more beneficial in livestock and coastal upland regions. Um, you want to make sure that you maintain a low level grazing to maintain plant diversity in open conditions. Uh, and this, especially in those coastal grazing marshes. 
Uh, you want to implement a control or targeted livestock grazing strategies, getting to know which species come in a different uh, time of the year might be essential so you can actually be able to manage and when you have to actually remove the livestock for those areas. Uh, this, along with coupling prescribed fire, can uh, create a headed immunity and diversity in vegetation communities and reduce occurrence of invasive species in Grand Lake communities, especially in the coastal area. So that's all I have. Uh, this is my contact information. And if you have any question, please feel free to contact me. Eric, I'll give it back to you. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rocky. I did see there was um, a couple questions pop up that I think it'd probably be best to answer answer now um there was one one message that was sent uh direct to me uh, basically stating that a lot of the cattle that's shown in these photos have kind of a a, a spanish look look to them spanish type cattle uh, i don't know if there's any comment uh that y'all have related to that on kind of like types of cattle that would be ideal for this conservation grazing work but um I wanted to put that out there to see if you had any if any of the presenters had any responses to that. And then uh, I'll get to the other questions right after that before we jump into Jim's presentation. Eric, I, I can allude a little bit to that. Yeah, most of these cattle that you're going to find in the pine woods, what we call pine wood cattle, are Spanish descendants. They are lower frame, they are more efficient, utilizes some of the uh, lower quality forage, uh, so they can survive in those environments much easier. Uh, but also, you know, it, it, you don't really have to have your Spanish uh, piney wood cattle in there, but also some type of Brahma influence that helps with uh, more heat tolerance in some type of environments, semi-tropical environments, environments might be something that can fit into the system as well. Yeah, any other presenter? I see Robert unmuted. Go ahead. I agree, Rocky. You know, the the Piney Woods cattle, a lot, a lot of times our heritage breeds do better in these places where we're talking acres per cow instead of cows per acre. Uh, whether it's Piney Woods cattle of the one of the different breeds of Piney Woods or whether it's some of the, the Longhorns, some of those, again, the Spanish influence. Uh, some of the African cattle uh, can do do well here as well. And so it, it's, it's, again, not the cow, it's the how, but picking the right cow is important. Awesome. And then um, another question that I think we'll address now, and I apologize to uh, Chambers English, your question, I feel like we'll save that to the end because it's a real heavy loaded uh, question there. But Randall Miller asked about what about other types of plants like crown vetch, um, subterranean clover and guinea grass? Um, Rocky, do you have any thoughts on on that for uh, um, potential forage? Yeah, guinea grass will fit into that system. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll be a little bit hesitant to recommend crown bitch. One thing is not very well adapted to our area. The seed is very expensive. Uh, so I don't think it from the economic management point of view will be very beneficial. Uh, subterranean clover can fit into that system, but also, you know, you, you might, if you're looking at some type of edge, remember, we also dealing with soils that are a little more acidic. So uh, some type of lespedisa will fit very well into the system. Uh, hairy vetch might be something that I would recommend instead of crown vetch that I can utilize in that system. We're starting to do some work looking at some of the semi-tropical uh, grasses like the bracarias here in Mississippi State because I travel in the national quite a bit in, in Central and South America and doing work over there. And we've seen a lot of benefit of using brack areas and the systems. Uh, so we are actually going to put a couple of demonstrations down at the uh, Sound Research Station. And I'm actually working with a producer in, in South Mississippi to see how that can integrate into uh, this system. They, they are very productive. They have a very strong root system that can produce a lot, in question, a lot of carbon, but also provide wood quality forage. We talk about 12 to 14% crude protein when they're very vegetative. So, uh, so I think there is a lot of benefit in some of the species that we can explore to, to introduce into the systems. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rocky. Um, I saw there was a, another question that came in, but we will uh, hold that one to the end after Jim's presentation. So next up, we have Jim Curry, who is kind of the instigator for this whole well, whole webinar here. Um, 
he's he's been been pushing us along to get this get this going i much appreciate it and uh Jim has a lot of experience on his own property um, doing this great conservation grazing type work and is going to share kind of the, some experiences that he's had in kind of a case study format. So, uh, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric, for those uh, <clears throat> kind comments. I think we all pushed ourselves uh, along equally, actually. Um let me see what I want to what I'm doing here. What us um okay, I think I'm ready. Uh, yeah, looks good on our end. Thanks. All Jim. right, great. Well, this is an outline of my property up in uh, North Hancock County, a coastal county in South Mississippi. Uh, there's no, uh, this is a kind of the paddock map of it, and there's no grand scheme of design at work here. What we, we kind of looked at the property. We've got a, got a major creek running along one, sort of toward one side of it. So that put our activities over on the bigger side. We've got an old, uh, sawmill, uh, mainline railroad uh, bed that runs through the county in the north end. You can see the vestige of it running through the landscape right across. So that kind of put us getting a good dividing line north and south. We've got one energizer for electric fences on the north side by our barn where we have power and one on the south side. We have a major county road on the north edge so that uh, alerted us on the liability side of things so obviously you know the one of the first you're contemplating doing grazing on your land one of the first questions is infrastructure we uh we utilize barbed wire only where we feel like we need to this is a typical five wire barbed wire fence out on the main road this is my preferred barbed wire fence uh, which is more wildlife friendly it's four strands you'll notice on both these wire fences the distance between the top two strands is greater than the others that's so a jumping deer doesn't get his hind legs caught in between two wires and uh, run into a problem the four wire fence allows a bigger space at the bottom so that turkeys and other animals can go right underneath it this is our preferred fence. This is a two wire high tensile fence. Uh, it, you know, it's fairly fast and inexpensive to put in. Uh, you put these wooden posts about every 70 feet or so. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a post there. There's a post way down there, another one way down there. Um, we have a lot of this on our perimeter as well, uh, you know, the perimeters that are not on a major road, but we've never had a problem with an animal getting out. Within within a secure paddock defined by, you know, any combination of the above three fences, we can subdivide with single strand hot wires. Um, You'll also need a, a place to confine the animals and to uh, squeeze them, as they say, to work them. Uh, our, our corral is a temporary cattle paddle, a, a temporary movable, portable cattle paddles, and they do move. By, I have a partner with the cattle, and he sometimes takes them over to his place to do things with them. You'll need a squeeze chute. A squeeze chute uh, will... will uh, intimidate you uh, if you go out and look at a traditional uh, squeeze chute because they're very expensive but they also have a uh, head gate in them they've run the cattle through them and then the gate kind of goes around the cattle's neck to hold it uh, tight well that doesn't work with uh, horned animals very well this is a bry, what's called a bry chute uh, you might want to make a note of it if you're contemplating it uh, you know, bryshoot.com. They're very simple, relatively inexpensive, very versatile. And uh, we use our screen, sh our shoot for, you know, branding, castrating uh, bulls, 
calves to make them into steers. And, you know, also when we load up an animal, because you will have to load them up periodically to get them off your property for one reason or the other. One thing we don't do in our shoots is pour on ivermectin or, or put other sorts of medicine because our dung beetles, uh, we want to encourage the dung beetles. Um, when the paddy hits the ground, uh, we should see a number of insects attracted to it right away. This butterfly is giving this one a ringing endorsement. The dung beetles fly nightly. They're the most amazing creatures. So by the next morning, you're going to see the air holes at the top of the paddies from the dung beetles. The tunnelers are taking the dung underneath the paddy. They take the dung underground so that they can lay their eggs in there. Uh, so you can see this these paddies getting converted to dirt from the dung beetles. The dwellers also come and live in the uh, paddy. Hopefully, the critical mass will be such that the turkeys will come and scratch the paddy apart and desiccate it. Uh, this is important because little black flies that get on the cattle, the horn flies, will um, lay their eggs in the paddy, and you want to interrupt their life cycle. Um, now, these are, we don't, you never have enough before shots. Uh, just bear in mind, the cattle came onto our place in 2018. They've been there for, you know, about five years now. These starting dates don't necessarily mean much in relation to that because we were building these paddocks serially. We, we'd, be, you know, build one after the other after the other. So the cattle came into different paddocks at different times. Um, but the thing to of all these pictures, you'll see some remnant of a bid story. The thing to remember there is that this is not, we weren't introducing cattle into some totally wild place. I'd owned the property for 20 years, been burning the whole time. Uh, the burning just wasn't moving the needle. You know, I still had a lot of bid story there. Um, this this okay so this top thing you can see the same area that today as opposed to just in 2020 uh this bottom area you can see that we on the left we must have had a good uh growing season burn that year in may or uh, june because they're in there on fresh forage but you can see a remnant of the mid-story that had, had obviously been in place this is this is the uh you know, this is the same site, same general area recently. Uh, this one, this site is actually uh, well in progress, as you can see, but you can see the top killed gallberry back there. Well, that that's a, a remnant of top killed gallberry. It, it, this site had been dominated by that at one time. You can see it today. It's becoming a lovely uh, little blue stem savanna. This is an area, this was an old logging deck that uh, used to grow up with a whole bunch of junk. And we could never get, when we burned, we couldn't get fire into it. This is 10 days later, and you can see how the uh, cattle have really worn out the uh, beauty berry uh, stand there. Um, the wildlife and aesthetics of wildlife have really responded. I got the best compliment uh, when uh, I toured. I took a friend in, uh, from the area who'd grown up in the area, took he and his wife on a tour of the place one day. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, at one time, the whole county used to look like your place looks. So that told me, man, I've, uh, I, can, I can die and go to heaven. I've, I've, I've done something. Um, now, FAQs, do you have to, now that you have cattle, do you still have to burn? Well, yeah, yeah, the burnings are just a lot easier, but we still want to burn. We, you know, we want to reset the whole system after some possible uh, selective grazing that happened. Uh, you can utilize a burning to your advantage because you're getting some fresh forage and by uh, alternating, you know, combining dormant season and growing season burns, you can get keep the fresh forage going longer for longer in the summertime. Another FAQ, how many head can I put on my place? Well, <laughs> the, uh, I, I've got, that's not the number I want to know about. I want to know about, uh, uh, 
Leibig's law of the minimum, that's a fancy way to say uh, a population that can be sustained on a resource uh, is not defined by the resource at its time of abundance, but by its time at the uh, at its scarcity. And for us, that's the winter time. And it seems like when you've got cattle on the place, winter's always around the corner. Um, Another uh, better question may be, how few head can I put on my place and receive the benefits of conservation grazing because of these factors that I mentioned up here? You've got to leave yourself some wiggle room uh, because uh, the, not a, the, all the place is going to be available to you all the time. So what is that number? Well, I don't know that number for sure, but I can relate to you uh, a uh, little Q&A that happened at a uh, CFA field day we had on the place recently. Somebody asked me that very question, how many head can I put on my place? And uh, I said, well, I went into this uh, based on what my friend J. B. Brown uh, told me, uh, that in the old free range days, they, the rule of thumb was a, a cow per seven acres. I said, now I can't imagine how that worked. And uh, JB, who was in the, uh, in the audience, uh, said, well, those fellas weren't interested in the resource, and I'm looking at putting cattle into my woods, and I'm looking at, 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 at a cow for 25 acres. And I said, okay, <laughs> JB, I can, I can, uh, that resonates with me. So um, I think uh, that's something that uh, it's worthwhile. And with that, I think we'll go on to the next stage. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, there's some there's some questions in here that uh, at, well, I guess we're transitioning into the Q and A time. We've got about thirty minutes before the end of the uh, end of the the time period that we said. So we got plenty of time for people to ask questions, have conversations, uh, and things like that. Um, one question in the and, and people everybody feel free to either unmute and ask the questions and while we're in kind of lull periods and I'll start off uh, now, but uh, I'll read off questions from the chat as well. But uh, one of them asks, what parasite management do you recommend for cattle, especially and sheep that will not harm uh, dung beetles and other soil microbes. So I'll turn that over to the presenters to um, see if they have any responses to that. Um, I, I I don't, but I see uh, I, I see that Leela uh, Rios is on the call. If she's still here, I, uh, Leela uh, is uh, uh, spoke one time about uh, ivermectin pollution. So I know she's uh, it's a subject that's near and dear to her heart. Yeah, and I guess along along those lines. Um... Like based on the the life cycles of the the parasites, you know, like if you get grazing going at an appropriate rotation, I don't know what that number is. I'm not a livestock expert by no means, um, but appropriate rotation, then your need for um, dewormer and things like that are uh, it drops down. It, it, would that that be a correct statement if they're uh, they're not able to the parasites aren't able to complete their life cycle? That's correct. You know, uh, rotation is going to be very important. Most of this parasite cycle is 21 days. So trying to maintain those animals, especially sh uh, sheep and goats, they, they need to be rotated out of those systems uh, and let them recover for at least 20 to, I usually look at 21 to 27 days. So you can actually break that cycle. But something that's very important when it comes to uh, Parasite control also, and I think the Torios will agree with me on this, is you need to have a, a different match score. You need to do those, make sure that you're only treating those animals that needed to be treated. Uh, most of the problems that we usually see with parasite resistance is when we go and they just take from my score on one animal in the herd and say, well, they got parasite, I'm going to treat the whole herd. You need to be more target specific, treating those that only need to be treated. And also um, to be able to 
uh, make sure that you're not creating uh, more resistance uh, by treating animals that don't need to be treated at that time. That's something to be very important. Uh, wh when it comes to um, uh, parasite um, control medications, um, I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to be able to give you doses, dosages or or um, or recommend a specific uh, uh, parasite compounds controlling that that are there in the market. So I will recommend is that you um, talk to your vet, consult with your vet, and what might be available that you can use uh, in that type of systems. Thank you. Um, I saw, and I'm going to get back to the what I called the loaded question earlier um, after after this one, but there was a question about, has anyone reintroduced bison anywhere in Mississippi, Louisiana, or I guess anywhere that you are aware of, like down here along the Gulf Coast, to serve livestock functions? This is Robert. Um, not that I know of. There are people that are grazing bison in some reintroduced prairie further west and a little bit further north. Um, there are people that have bison uh, down here, but they are not doing it for conservation function. That said, I've got one landowner right now that is putting up a fence and plans to to get a few bison uh, and see what see what happens in his woods. It, with with conservation grazing being the goal. Yeah. Well, not... To to one of the, the the other questions we were talking about earlier about what breeds, um, and it'll be interesting to see Rocky's take on this as well. Um, in addition to to having a difference in ability to browse rough rougher forages, some of the heritage breeds we see a difference in behavior in the woods as well. We don't see Pawnee Woods cows typically wading down to the ponds and standing in the ponds when it gets hot. You see them headed for the hills and headed for the shade, uh, like you do some of the Angus and some of the other breeds. And so we see a difference in behavior that it impacts ecosystem impacts as well. Yeah, and just following up on that, we put out a survey as part of a, a NOAA, a NOAA Restorac Science Program funded project that kind of kickstarted at least our, my group on uh, looking into this conservation grazing work. Uh, and the survey went out to a lot of like livestock producers, natural resource managers, and researchers. And um, we asked a lot of different questions. I'll post a link to the publication in the chat here in a minute, but. Um, one of them was being uh, perceived difficulty for containment and bison was by far and away like the ones from the responses that we got that people were most concerned about on the containment side of things, but also thought it would have uh, a very large ecosystem benefit too. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I just want to mention that when we were talking about bison and then to get back, like I said, I'll post a link to that in the chat here in a second, but I want to get back to, the question that was asked earlier or the set of questions. One of them was, how do you recommend estimating carrying capacity for standing mixes of native vegetation in savanna habitats? Um, and then the next one, and we, we can break these up in responses, would be how much supplemental feed or non-native grazing areas needed? And then what timing and frequency of prescribed fire do you recommend? Um, so if anybody wants to take a stab at answering any of those, um, and then we'll get back to some of the new questions. I'll, I'll take a, a shot at those real quick. Good questions, Chambers. Um, looking at some of the historic uh, Forest Service publications for Piney Woods, uh, whether it's Longleaf Pine Wiregrass or Longleaf Pine Blue Stem Range, gives you a good shot, but a lot of cases those are, and and Rocky did a great job earlier talking about one animal unit per 10 acres, and those, those are in good condition. In most of the cases, our, our, our ranges are not in good condition, so it's going to be even poorer, and we're going to start off with a lower stocking rate, maybe a cow-calf pair for 10, 8 to for 20 acres or 25 acres or even 50 acres, and I think Jim hit the nail on the head. It's not how many you can have, but how few I can have and get the impacts that I want. Um, it's not not the maximum we're looking at, but the the fewness and our winter range that that um, that uh, cane break that Rocky talked about that was the critical winter forage that was overgrazed during our free range criteria because everybody had access to it, and then we stopped fire and that just killed it. 
uh, literally. Um, and so we we need some winter habitat. In a lot of cases, that means me taking the pond, the cows out of the woods and putting them on ryegrass somewhere, or putting them in a more silva pasture system where we've taken an agricultural field and put it into a, a pecan orchard with clover underneath it, or, or whatever it is. But a lot of cases, we need something in the winter to either move the cows onto, or bring supplemental feed into the woods. In that case, it might be taking a ring of peanut hay and putting it in your nastiest thicket and getting some of those impacts that Brandon was talking about, building soil organic matter in some of our nasty areas. Um, and again, talking about prescribed fire, we get our best graze six to eight weeks after fire. And so having a rotational prescribed burn impact where we're burning a number of paddocks and you know you need you need at least seven paddocks, maybe 14 or more uh, to rotate your your cows through to get what you want, especially if you're going to take some out for regeneration or whatever. And so if you're trying to burn something every six to eight weeks where your cows can move around or your goats or your sheep, where you can move them, that's going to give you your best um, best results, both both from a, a ecosystem perspective and from a herd health perspective, I think. And so that's my, my shots to your, your questions, Chambers. Yes, yeah, any other hey, um, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. I was just gonna say uh thank you for your response and um taking the time to uh talk about this topic, trying to learn um elsewhere in the southeast on this practice and uh, appreciate the information. Thank you for yeah. attending. If I can add something to that, to the comments from Robert, too, you know, when it comes to the time and frequency of prescribed fire, also it depends what your goals are. You know, sometimes the, if if your goal is to have more grazing in the fall and the uh, summer, where then probably that prescribed fire is going to come er, early, er, late winter, early spring, where you're going to have a lot of that fire helping germinate some of the seeds that might get established for for that more warm season perennial grasses. If your target is try to have something that will help you mitigate some of the uh, having to feed so much hay in the wintertime, you might look at more fall uh, fire where I can come behind that fall fire and maybe introduce some small grains or a ryegrass that are more shade tolerant to those areas and be able to have some potential grazing later in the, in the wintertime. So it, it just depends on what you go and manage my baby. Awesome. Anybody else have any comments on that set of questions? Well, one of the other things that we've lost from a historic grazing perspective is we've lost the chestnuts and, and chinka pens. Uh, and we shouldn't discount the, the there was heavy use of mast, both soft mast and hard mast in the fall, fattening cows, calves, sheep, goats, pigs up to get them into the winter in, in better shape. And we've lost that on the landscape level. Uh, we've lost those those mass species. Uh, and we, we don't need to forget that our animals are using those live oaks, water oaks, uh, other oaks heavily uh, in the fall and persimmons. And I just like to add that, uh, um, can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you. All right, uh, yeah, I'd just like to add that the old, uh, Piney Woods uh, tradition was to supplement with cottonseed meal in the wintertime, uh, mixed often with salt just to limit the end of the uptake. And we, we do that and we do that. And we have one one particular area that's a big flat that we like to stockpile that uh, for, for forage. And the cottonseed meal along with stand and forage seems to hold them pretty well. Uh, we don't we try not to feed them hay. I mean, it's just I hate to spend money uh, on them. It's the whole problem. But uh, cottonseed meal seems to get them along as long as there's some standard forage. Awesome. Um, I'm going to move down the, the list. And uh, the next question that I see on there is, what are some key indicators or tests that I can um composed to know if I'm headed in the right direction. And they also asked if the extension office does need soil micro testing. Um, I, on the, the latter part of that, I'm, I'm not sure if the extension service does soil micro testing, but it's something I can look up. Um, but yeah, I guess 
key indicators of whether like for, I guess, pasture or, um, or just general habitat management health, you know, if that's going in the right directions, anybody got any thoughts on that? Uh, I can take it from the soil's perspective. Um, so when we do soil health assessments within RCS, uh, generally we, we do the shovel test is primarily the big thing. So going out into your pastures, going out into your crop field, going out into the forest, digging a pit, you know, using a sharpshooter spade, what have you, a 12 inch pit and look at that soil in its entirety. You know, does it look like it's compacted? Uh, typically soils that are compacted will have structures that look like plates that are put together. Uh, or is it well aggregated? Does it have a dark color to it? If that does have a dark color to it, how deep does that dark color go? Usually the dark color on soils, especially in top soils going into the immediate subsurface is an indicator of soil organic matter. Um, especially in these savanna piney wood soils, uh, if you're seeing that darkness encroach down to the profile, it's a pretty good indicator. You got some mi good microbial biomass there incorporating those organic, stable organics into the soil. The other thing, this is going to sound extremely silly, but I'm telling you it works and we do it. Uh, we do it with uh, producers here in Louisiana and we also do it with uh, schools and stuff like that is the, uh, is a soil, your underwear test. Uh, so taking a pair of, of cotton whitey tidies and actually burying them in the ground and monitoring that over time to see is all that cotton eaten away and the only thing left over is spandex. It doesn't quantify what types of microbes you have in the soil, but it gives you a really good idea that if those underwear disintegrate over a short period of time, you have a really active biological community below the ground. Um, it's a silly test, and but it really does work. Um, it, it's pretty amazing to see. And the only other thing, and I can't, I can't advocate for them, but there are a couple of national laboratories around that will do like phospholipid fatty acid, uh, PLFA tests to, to at least get down to the functional groups of what microbes are in the soil. So like one laboratory in particular is Ward Laboratories. Um, they have a pretty good website that talks about how to sample the soils for biological testing. And they're going to tell you, you know, the, the available nitrogen in the soils this is going to break down so much in terms of the the complex chemistry behind soil health um you know they'll have that return to you so that's one recommendation to actually quantify um yeah i can't i don't know if extension does it or not but those are just some the the best way when we do so again doing soil health assessments digging a shovel looking at the soils looking at the aggregates seeing any signs of life in there does it look like an inert mass of nothing if it does it's pretty poor soils generally speaking or does it look like it has that cottage cheese granular the somewhat ag well aggregated structure um those are the things we look at hey that sounds great uh i'm lee i, I asked the question um does anybody go a little bit deeper into like analyzing, you know, the fatty acid and like the nutritional profile of like the animal, like the livestock itself? Like once you get like a, a steak uh, in, in the freezer, like are, are we looking at, you know, what is the meat composed of like based on like what we're um, grazing, uh, like for forest grazing versus like a, a, a field full of uh, like monocropped uh, grasses? Yeah. That, that's going to be one of the challenges, Lee, and that's one of the things that we're working with Jim and others on is trying to develop a market for for this this uh, organic, um, sustainably grown beef. And I grew up eating cows that were running the woods, and it's not uh, a fatty marble piece of meat. It's a lean piece, and if, if they're grazing, especially early on, if they're grazing much uh, gallberry and yopon and things, it frankly doesn't taste that good. Again, even back in the 1500s, uh, Pamphilio de Narvaez said the 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 bison tasted better than the the Spanish cattle, and that hasn't changed a whole lot. We've got breeds now that that grow marble meat, and uh, we we need to develop a, a market for some of these cows. Again, you're taking a hit when you go to the the sale with a horned cow that's not black. I mean, you're you're knocking off a hundred bucks a head right there. And then you've got this piece of meat that's uh, not fatty, not marble. We can we can put them on some some uh, uh, clover bahia I mean clover uh, annual ryegrass and fatten them up and get a little bit better bump. But yeah, it's it's not it, it's a different piece of meat. I uh, need you know as far as I know, nobody's really looking at what that means chemically. And uh, first, we we've got to we've got to hey get get this 
sustainable amount of cows coming out of the woods out there, and then two, develop a market. You know, I'm going to expand a little bit also on the uh, indicators. I think, Lee, you know, from the uh, from the forest side, you you know, be a, be good to start doing a, a resource inventory of what what species are there and see what species are beneficial and which are not, and then be able to do a, a, a annual evaluation to see how those species are shifting and which species are disappearing, which species might be coming in that might be either beneficial or not beneficial. So, so it's it's a, it's a consistent uh, uh, evaluation of shift and the species every time that you have a grazing system and depending on the grazing pressure you put in, you're going to see those. Uh, Plant composition shift, so it's, it's. I think that's a very important part of that component. And re referring to the question of microbial activity, no, Mississippi State Extension do not do microbial activity tests. They are very expensive. Uh, the Cornell Lab does the soil health analysis lab, a test, and it's about hundred and I think it's hundred and thirty dollars per sample. So it's not a very cheap test to do. So, uh, but there's tests available out there. If you're looking at uh, uh, respiration microbial activity, uh, I know that Cornell will give you a total microbial activity test. There's another private companies that if you want to know which microbes actually are active and that's all they can do. And uh, I can find the uh, name of the company, but their test is about $700 per sample. So, uh, so from the economic point of view of actually doing those tests, I think it's, 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 it's not really feasible unless you're in the research component and you have a big grant that you can do that. Uh, and we're rather about, yeah, meat quality might be a little bit different on, uh, you know, a gray cow that's been uh, raised on a in a in a piney wood grass mix system that you're gonna see with a cow that have been on a uh, on a grain fed system. So yeah, there's gonna be some variations on on the marbling. I think one of the things that we need to focus also is is a more education and the perception that we have of of what that mean, means because uh, I travel all over Central and South America and you will not find a a piece of meat that have been uh, finished on grain. And probably when I go to Argentina and Brazil, probably one of the best steaks I've ever seen. And it's all based uh, on grass production. So so we need to start changing also the conception of our educating our consumers better about what the product is as well. Yeah, and then um, Rob, Robert brought up the term of, of building markets kind of from the other other side of things something that um we're hoping with a lot of as we learn more about when and where and how to do like conservation grazing um particularly with cattle and goats in these coastal upland habitats um trying to build a, a market for um graze like livestock producers to actually like make a living running around and grazing areas that need to be grazed for habitat management purposes. Um, I know there's some folks on the uh, on the webinar now that are submitting some proposals to do some relatively large scale grazing in some uh, areas that need some habitat management. Um, and so I say that all to say, if there's any livestock producers or y'all know livestock producers that would be interested in like possibly doing that as a portion of their business, diversifying a little bit, feel free to reach out to me or anybody else on, on the team. We can all connect with each other um, because I, I see that as a potential, um, a potential need for the contacts from our perspective, but also potential market um, in the future for some, some uh, larger tracts of land. Um, then we have a couple other questions. One of them is, what are some of the challenges of conservation grazing in coastal high marshes and chenilles? Uh, for one, has anybody got any thoughts on that one? In, in it's it's different, a little different in in Texas and Louisiana with with the chenilles, and so I, I won't address the chenilles, but. Thinking about coastal marshes in most of the the deep south, whether it's it's Georgia, South Carolina, all the way around to, to Louisiana, most of those marshes are not owned uh, by individuals, but are controlled by the state. And so there's some real issues with how you do it with with permitting. Uh, even if you hold title to the marsh, uh, getting a permit to put a fence in the marsh um, 
isn't easy. I've, I've done it in Georgia. Um, and so there are a lot of cases in our coastal marshes that that becomes very difficult, just access. And it's so much so that it's uh, not worth the hassle. Yeah, I, I agree. Like a like mo I'm a I'm a marsh ecologist. That's what I've you know that's what I've learned the most about. And um yeah, the like compaction, compaction, permitting, um, and all that kind of stuff would be major, major things to think about um there. And I want to try to get to as many of the questions as we can. There's a a relatively easy one, I would say, that I'm gonna adjust from Diana. I said most of these methods require a massive um, Massive amounts of land. What about small and micro homesteads? I think a lot of that can play into what I mentioned earlier about the um, building the market for this con contract grazing. Like I know that there's grazers throughout the U.S. Just I'm not familiar with a lot of them around here. Uh, and by here, I mean the northern Gulf of Mexico area um, that do that kind of work. But a lot of them don't have much land because they're always out grazing on other people's land so that's that's one i don't know if anybody wants to elaborate on this um but we got about seven more minutes and i got one more question at least that i want to ask but anybody got any elaboration on that i think if you're looking at small land i will concentrate on small ruminant prairie goats because it require the last least amount of, of land uh mm -hmm. you know especially if you have a lot of areas that is a lot of uh, brush vegetation shrubs then i will focus on those small ruminants more than anything else. Awesome. Um, uh, another question is like how the USDA plant hardiness zones are updating um, over time. And uh, Fawn asked if that is accounted for in suggested conservation grazing practices. I'm going to be honest, I have very little faith on those hard, plant hardening zones. I think they apply more to hold the culture across more than anything else that what we do in, in the grazing systems side of cattle production. So uh, I don't see those actually may, playing a major role in what we do uh, from conservation grazing or livestock production. Thank you. Um... Another question that um, just came in is asked if there's a demand for landowners or managers to lease their lands to operators following conservation grazing guidelines. I think that's one thing we would like to see develop, just like Eric was talking earlier. We'd like to see a market developed where there are people that have have animals that uh, would, would take them around and graze people like the small acreage people were just talking about. Um, we see a demand for it out west. Uh, we see uh, the Apalachicola National Forest is providing a, a thousand, couple of thousand acres of conservation grazing to a, a landowner down there right now where they are leasing out and seeing some of those impacts. Uh, elsewhere in the deep south, we're really not seeing that. Um, we're not seeing, and so one of the one of the difficulties of that gets to be the capital investment. Uh, am I going to bring my animals and put them on your property without a good fence? Uh, am I going to put the fence on without a 20-year agreement? You know, it's it becomes... Um, we'd love to see that develop. And right now, I don't see it. I'd, I'd like to speak to that too, uh, because I've talking to some of the old people that used to, you know, went back to the open range days. They tell me the progression that happened was that they moved from, uh, from that to, to, you know, graze, putting up some, you know, rolling out some fences and grazing on private lands. But then uh, when the advent of hunting club, leasing hunting rights came along, that the hunters would pay more for the land that they could afford to pay for it. So they couldn't compete with the, uh, you know, the doctors and the lawyers that were uh, buying hunting, hunting leases. And that, that kind of shut, that's when the, uh, as hunting, right leasing got popular that's when the cattle came out of the woods yeah and i'll, I'll also add to that um a little bit uh it kind of referencing back to that survey that we put out a while back um 
and don't quote me exactly on the numbers because I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say it was like 95% plus of the natural resource managers that we surveyed were interested in learning more and potentially integrating conservation grazing into like a tool, as Robert mentioned, into their tool chest. Um, but I think it was less than 10% of them were aware of any information that was out there that could help inform uh, those type of grazing practices that was locally relevant. So um, I, I know there's a huge demand for managing lands uh, in, a, in a way that is conducive for conservation grazing. Um, right now, it's just not a tool that's been used as often. Um, so yeah, as, as Robert mentioned, like I'm, I'm hoping with webinars like this and uh, like everybody talking about it a little bit more that there will be more um, more demand on both sides um, of this equation. But yeah, Robert, I see you're unmuted. If you want to jump in, no, I was I was getting ready to respond to Willie's question. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, yeah, yeah, that that was it for me. So yeah, go ahead. So is there something I could plant now to help with little or no hay? And that's gonna be a site Rocky's come up with a suge one suggestion and that's going to be site specific what what's the soils what's the site what's the the hydrology in the area uh what's there now and what uh what's the intent what do you need it for what you know what can you plant uh, and you know switch grass even by itself can be can be bail for hay and it's it's going to provide some drought resistance uh it's going to provide more hay during a drought than than bermuda or bahia or fescue uh, but it's not drought proof. It's going to still have less tons per acre than it would in a good year. Um, there's no magic bullet grass plant that I know of that you can can plant that's going to help. But having a diversity of grasses, Rocky talked about things that were coming on in different times of the year. And that's one of the real benefits. If you look at the longleaf piney woods, where you may have 50 to 80 species per square meter. Uh, and a lot of those being grasses and and good good forbs, asters and legumes that are, are fairly high nutrition. Yeah, they're not going to produce as much. And so we're, we're already talking acres per cow instead of cows per acre. And then like Jim said, you get into a drought situation and it's, it's Liebig's law of the minimum. And it's not just the winter. Uh, um, it's just what can get through. So, so he's, he said, we're trying to get something now to help until April. Uh, if you're trying to do something now, then you're you're looking at, at pretty much uh, annual ryegrass to to get get you through from now until April with with no hay, um, and so it's going to be rotational grazing. Uh, you may throw in some clovers through there, but they're they're not really going to come on until March with some of the like uh, crimson clover. Uh, you know, so yeah, there's there's it's a tough time of the year if you you went into the situation with no hay and the, the hay prices right now. All right. Well, um, I think that pretty much gets us right to our, our time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, sticking it out. Uh, we've still got over 100 people in the room. I think that's pretty impressive And um, for, a, for a webinar. And then uh, thank the presenters for sharing all this knowledge and answering all the questions. And I also like to thank Sarah Harrison from from uh, our our office here, she was behind the scenes putting a lot of this stuff together. So I wanted to uh, not end before thanking her on that. And um, yeah, if anybody's interested in anything that we're talking about or talking more, we're all ears. Uh, as you can tell, we all like to talk. Um, so shoot us an email and then we can go from there. And thank y'all.